real excited to be moderating this because I, like a lot of you, want to hear what um, patients have to say. Um, so uh, you know the saying, the difference between uh, Mother Teresa and doctors is that Mother Teresa only has to answer to God and we have to answer to our patients. So with that start, um, maybe Alan can start and just comment on your diagnosis, your treatment, how you felt before and after, and how you're doing now. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, first, I just want to thank this marvelous group of practitioners. Uh, I feel so grateful and fortunate I'm, to have been in Dr. Sweater's care now for seven years. I've been under Dr. Greco's knife a couple of times. I've been treated by Dr. Reddy, Dr. Dan Chen, and of course, um, Nurse Laura Morris, the fantastic <laughs> Nurse Laura Morris. Those of you who have the pleasure of knowing her and being uh, held by her and, and uh, all of this through all this process. Um, I was first diagnosed in 2007, late 2007, uh, almost exactly now, um, uh, seven years ago. Uh, I had a lesion on my arm that I thought essentially was a, a rash that was persistent. It was, turned out to be amelanotic, and at the time I was diagnosed, it ended up being a stage 2A. So I had uh, that, uh, that tumor removed and, uh, and also had the, the um, sentinel lymph node uh, biopsy. That turned out to be equivocal, so we decided to take some more lymph nodes out, and that was done a couple of weeks later. Um, I think they took 19 or 20. One of those looked funny, so there was some question about whether I would just go right on to interferon then. But then upon some further analysis, it looked like that, the, that was okay. So I went two and a half years um, with essentially feeling fine. It just had the, the surgery to recover from, and that was no big deal. It was just you know tight, tight skin for a while. Um, and then in May of 2010, I noticed a lump right below the scar and uh, had that checked out immediately. Turned out to be uh, a tumor. Uh, so after that was all over, it was a stage 3B. And uh, then it was um, radiation on the arm as well as one month of interferon. We decided to do one month of interferon because there was a Greek study that seemed to indicate that that was as efficacious as doing the full uh, regimen, the full 12 month regimen. I was able to do about 15 of the 20 sessions. My liver blew up during the process and I put that in quotes, um, uh, but uh, so I was, uh, I did about three quarters of it. Um, those of you who've done interferon know what it's like. It's like having the flu pretty much all the time, uh, not much fun. Um, but I recovered pretty quickly from that. I was riding my bike, I think about uh, five days after the last session. Uh, so went fine there for, for another um, year. And then in May of 2011, I noticed a, a node in my arm, uh, in my arm, um, on the underside of my arm, uh, had that diagnosed immediately. It was uh, another tumor. And then a, a scan showed two tumors in the liver. So now I was stage four M1C. Um, over the next couple of months, that turned into about seven, I think, where they had found total. I started IPI at that time in uh, late June of 2011, and at that time I figured maybe I had nine months left. Uh, it was hard to know. Um, after the second session, um, I was working with Dr. Dan Chen on this. Um, we decided that what we would do something uh, that I don't think had been done here before, and that was to combine IPI with um, radiation to the two tumors, two of the larger tumors in the liver. And, um, and we did that in August of 2011. I had my third and fourth uh, IPI sessions um, in August and September, and then I think about a week after my IPI session, I was in the hospital for five days because of a severe autoimmune response. Um, at that point, they administered prednisone, which essentially shut down the, the IPI process, and um, and I've been I've been doing fine. I had I was. Um, uh, I've had my final scan almost, well, 35 months ago uh, that showed, showed um, no cancer. Um, so, thank you. <laughs> um, so, and, and that's been the case uh, now for um, almost three years. Uh, I still feel like I'm in the woods um, because that's the way this is. Uh, 
So that's that's the sort of scientific end. There's more to say on this subject, but maybe I'll, I'll maybe we'll come back. And um, I think I think there's some things that Kim touched on that are very important uh, for anyone who's going through this or any family member is going through this that I think we need to pick up. But I'll just stop for now, and hopefully we can come back to that. Okay, Madam Clausen, you're up. Uh, my name's Laura Clausen, and. Um, I worked in the operating room here at Stanford as a surgical technician. Um, so I've been on the other side of the knife, and uh, it's rough. Um, I discovered a node in my neck uh, one day while I was working and scrubbing on a radical neck case, <laughs> the irony, and um, it came back positive. And uh, so I ended up having... Um, a radi uh, modified radical neck, prodidectomy on the left side, and I thought I hit the ground at stage zero, but it came back four. So my world fell apart. Um, so there was recovery from that surgery. It was pretty drastic. And then uh, I saw Dr. Reddy, and we were going to start um, a series of treatments, but it had spread. Uh, the melanoma had spread to uh, my lungs, so I had another surgery, which I've also scrubbed on. <laughs> and uh, that was a VATS, video-assisted thoracoscopy, um, with three wedge resections. And then I discovered a lump in my axilla shortly after that, so that was removed. Uh, the wonderful thing is, you know, I got to pick my, my team, hand pick them. <laughs> the bad thing is I, I knew what I looked like in surgery and, you know, the kind of music they were going to listen to and the jokes and stuff. But I had the best care in the world and uh, the team of surgeons, um, particularly the one from the get-go, Dr. Kaplan, uh, he didn't waste any time. I went from having a, a diagnosis at a lunch hour to a scan that night to being a patient formally to the next week, my first surgery. So in the midst of all this, uh, I was supposed to get radiation to my neck, which had to be postponed because I had all these other surgeries that would come up. Um, but I ended up having the radiation. That was a month, 22 rounds, and that was pretty brutal and uh, very scary, um, just frightfully scary. Uh, so I developed high anxiety because you're locked onto this table in a mask that you can't even open your eyes and blink or talk. Um, but then eventually I fell into uh, Dr. Reddy's care, and uh, he said we'd start <laughs> off with the, the worst of the the worst of the treatments first, and that was interleukin-2, which, as was previously mentioned, it's a week in the hospital and ICU, then a week out, then a week back in, and I was determined to set the record for treatments, but I only made 13 of 14 rounds, um, and that was the worst. Uh, I was not prepared for the capillary leak um, and the weight gain, uh, 45 pounds in like three and a half, four days. You just puff up and then you go home for a week on Lasix and you know you flush all that out and then you go back in and you repeat it again your skin stretches and then it's like the worst sunburn but it's not superficial it's coming off in layers and I won't get too graphic about that but apparently I didn't respond to the interleukin 2 so next on the list was ipilimumab and that wasn't bad uh, at all. A couple months, I think it was once every three weeks, um, but I also didn't respond to the level that was hoped for. And in between this time, I had a couple bronchoscopies and a pneumothorax and threw a blood clot to the lung and um, a couple broken ribs spontaneously, no reason. Uh, but then Dr. Reddy referred me up to a clinical trial at uh, California Pacific Medical Center. <laughs> Uh, that was a year ago in August, so I am participating with nivolumab, or PD-1, um, through Bristol Myers Squibb, and um, I go every other week for an infusion up to San Francisco. It's not bad. Main side effects, I get thirsty, but basically the first two years, you know, I spent preparing to die and trying to see as many people, and it was pretty doom and gloom emotionally. And then uh, a year ago, the day before Thanksgiving, I got the word that my scans uh, looked really good, that 
either tumors were gone or they had shrunk. Um, that was the best Thanksgiving. So I have been responding ever since. Um, I'm in a very small percentage that has responded, um, and they, the doctors up there pretty much say that I'm in complete remission, um, which I'm very thankful for and can't say enough for the level of care and the doctors. Uh, I've scrubbed with Dr. Sun Wu on some cases and even Dr. Greco. <laughs> and uh, I'm just happy to be alive and now my focus is, okay, I, I've beat this so far. My body's pretty amazing and it's on survivorship, which I have pretty much not addressed throughout this process. I just hit the ground running and uh, this is the hard part is, um, taking care of the mental aspect of what's happened and my spirit. And uh, I want to thank AIM too, uh, because at a really dark phase about a month and a half ago, uh, I got on their website and um, scrolling through the happenings. And in Campbell, there was a free uh, seminar put on by Healing Journeys. And I thought, well, that's pretty close. I think I'll go. And it changed my life emotionally. Um, I met two other women with the same diagnosis, one who I'm going to see uh, next week. She lives in Berkeley. She's 23 years out with her stage 4 melanoma. And another lady up north, uh, about my age, she's taking a pill. I don't know. We, we were just too Gabby, and things were flying. And, but it was the sense of hope, like talking with another survivor. and realizing that I need to make a difference and change my thought process and uh, see what I can do out there to help other people. So that's, that's it in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, Beverly. My name's Beverly Slavic. I have melanoma in the fourth stage. I discovered some lumps under my arm and I went into the local doctor, cancer doctor, and uh, they took some uh, biopsies and they said it was melanoma, deadly. And I said, how long do I have? And they said, a year and a half. Let me tell you, when you're told you're gonna die, it does something to your brain, your head. I got into two car accidents in that period of time. I told my family and they said, you need to get a second opinion. So they referred me. I went back to the doctor, and I said, I want you to refer me to the best melanoma doctor Stanford it has. And um, they gave me Sunil A. Reddy. I owe my life to him. But anyway, I started coming down here, and uh, I told them I didn't want to take the hard drug chemo, the hardcore. So he um, started me with Epi he, infusions. I came down. I had four sessions about three every three weeks for four or five months. Um, and it helped my immune system. I have a discoloration um, in my skin vitiligo that's caused from my immune system kicking in. Thank you. Um, it, it, it's, it's just a step you take. You just agree to take these medicines and I told him I'm guinea pig for anything you have to offer. And um, if he did good and after that, he said, I'm not quite sure where you're going yet. He said, I do have a drug, Tafnilar. And um, I started taking that, and my scan showed the activity of the cancer was decreasing. And now it's almost none. I'm down to point 0.1 or something like that, so I hope the next time there's nothing there. So I owe my life to Reddy and the medicines that um, he gave me. And um, my final thought is you have to be positive and have all the trust in your doctors. Um, I think that's a big help for the cancer, to be positive and uh, don't be down. 
because you're going to beat this. And um, like I said, I owe my life to Reddy and Laura Morris. And that's my story. <laughs> Any other further comments? I still have anything you have to offer, I'll take. <laughs> okay, all right. I appreciate your, your compliments. You can pick up your check on the way. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so Cindy, I actually, um, I, I, I'd like to just say one thing, and it really, really um, sort of mirrors what Laura said. And, and my wife and I were talking about this on the way down. And, you know, we just heard two hours of incredible science and um, amazing medicine, amazing breakthroughs, uh, skilled practitioners, um, the best place in the world to come if, you're, if you've got melanoma, certainly, or certainly one of them. Um, but anybody who's had this disease, um, as Laura, as both folks here have said, as all of us have said, this really changes your whole outlook on things. And so the thing I think that, that, that I would share with any patient really are sort of three things. And the first is find a paradigm that works for you to hold it. Um, the main paradigm that we tend to use here is one of um, a, a, a struggle. Uh, there's a war, it's a battle against it, we're going to beat it. Um, and that's a very valuable paradigm for many people. For some reason, it just didn't work for me. Um, for me, the main paradigm was more of investigation. What's going on here? What can I learn from it? And how can I learn from what's going on? Uh, the second thing I would say is um, ask yourself, if you had this disease, what would a wise person do? How would they respond? I remember having this conversation with my wife on my way down here to have my stitches removed from the stage three surgery, looking at potentially doing radiation or interferon or possibly both, not being my preference, certainly. Um, but then asking, well, what's, what, how, would, how would somebody who's really the embodiment of wisdom face this? And, and they would face it by saying simply, oh, whichever door or sets of doors open, this is, what, this is what is, and therefore my job is to say, oh, interferon is like this, radiation is like this, I'm going to use it to try to under increase my wisdom, my compassion, and my gratitude. And then finally, uh, the, the main point that I would make is just in the same way that we as mature people um, learn not to have our happiness dependent upon, upon getting our preferences, but on really just our response to just getting what, whatever it is that happens to us. Ensure that your sense of well-being, your happiness, does not depend upon a medical outcome. Um, otherwise, every day is a day of worry. Uh, there's another way to live. Um, and whatever the outcome happens to be, if you live from the standpoint of being, being independent of how the medical thing works out, finding happiness and well-being through some other channels, um, that's going to serve you regardless of how it plays out. Certainly community is huge. Um, I have the, the great honor of being in a marvelous community, starting with my wife, my family, my friends, my relatives, my practitioners, um, and those community ties are so important. So. Do what you can to um, really uh, encourage and develop those community ties, and that will carry you very far. So, so that's my thought on it. <laughs>